Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. And my guest once again today is Mr. Norm Young, a Microsoft MVP and a senior strategic consultant at AvPoint. Welcome, Norm. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. Last time I was here, I had a bit of a job title change, no longer a senior strategic consultant. Always had to look up what that meant. Could never explain it to my parents. <laughs> now I'm a power platform solutions architect at that point. And again, I still have to explain to my parents what that means. What that means. Yeah, yeah. But I'm happy I, with the change. I've given up on trying to explain to my my wife and my kids. I've had that throughout uh, their lives. You know, it's like, and what do you do again? It's like, just tell them I do marketing stuff. I work with tech companies and I do marketing stuff. So that's the generic answer. So. Yes. And uh, I wish I had a, a good answer for friends and family when I explain what I do, but I just divert back to, I surf the internet a lot. I drink lots of coffee and just generally try and know some things. Just tell people you're an accountant. They will never have follow-up questions. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll be like, oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I got it. Uh, no, that, that's enough, Norm. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Well, this is, I know it's been a while, like we were trying to do this uh, on a, a, a more frequent clip, but just the uh, life and activities, uh, and then also the the summer doldrums of uh, the lack of Microsoft news that happens in like July through mid-September. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, we what we're focusing on today is some of the announcements that came out of the Power Platform Community Conference down in Las Vegas and specifically talk about Copilot Agents and Power App Plan Designer and yes. how those pieces work together. So Very good job. Exciting stuff. Very yeah. exciting. And well, we should also say that that's one of the few times that you and I get to interact face-to-face -face is at events like that, even if we are working hard out on the uh, exhibitor hall floors. But these conferences are, uh, are great to allow the attendees to get out of the the daily work routine, get focused, hopefully get excited about some of the new technology and for people like you and I to connect and um, really take stock of those announcements. I mean, if you've been following Microsoft technology for as long as you have, Christian, to the same degree with me, you know, like there's always a bit of a hype cycle with all of this stuff. And then maybe a year later, uh, the features start to land and it's hard for Microsoft or, or any other SaaS software provider to, to hit those big marketing expectations. And, you know, sometimes that minimum viable functionality leaves people wanting. Uh, but as we come into this, this co-pilot driven era within Microsoft, uh, everyone sees the promise of generative AI. Everyone sees the promise of what co-pilot can do. And we're starting to really get our hands on with the tooling as it exists today. And, you know, are, are we hitting all of those those high points and expectations that we've set through the marketing machine, probably not, but I still see value in what's happening and what's coming out. And so for me, uh, I'm always interested in anything Microsoft Cloud, uh, Power Platform Conferences is always the highlight of the year for me. And, uh, you know, I, I like getting uh, immersed with the technology and surrounded by people who get hands on and just build stuff. Yeah. especially when it's that integration with Microsoft 365 and the Power Platform. And so one of those crossover points is Copilot. And so yeah. we've seen quite a few announcements coming out at the uh, uh, Power Platform conference, not just Power Platform related announcements, it's also on Microsoft 365. So what was the, the big announcement for you on the M365 side? Well, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's been quieter for a while. I mean, everything has been so Copilot heavy. I actually want to, so as far as announcements, uh, you know, I mean, the agents is, is interesting and we're going to get into that just because of, you know, some of what I've been playing with, with Copilot, as well as with ChatGPT. As you know, I've been a paid ChatGPT user for well over a year, but like more like a year and a half of, of playing with that. But, you know, it, AI is something that I remember talking with uh, a good friend who sold his uh, consulting company, started a product company in 2014. 15, I believe, reached out for some help with marketing strategy where they were building bots and they were building these, these tools for, uh, for different organizations around HR and around support and things there. So it's not like that 
you know, of what's trying to be accomplished on the business side. I mean, a lot of these conversations have been around. It's just the underlying technology, of course, has advanced uh, mm -hmm. greatly. Um, but I actually want to get back to something that you just said too around, um, you know, these events. Like it used to be pre-pandemic, the the Microsoft uh, marquee events, the three big ones. You had Build, Inspire, formerly as the Worldwide Partner Conference, and then Ignite. And the difference between those three events used to be um, build was developer focused, Inspire was sales and marketing focused, and Ignite was the IT pro admin uh, focused. And that you would have usually with build, uh, you would have uh, the, the, the volume of presentation was around like cutting edge, bleeding edge. Here's what's going on. Here's what the, the engineering teams are working on. Here's what research teams, here's what your know, partners are working on very much for that engineering side of the house. Um, you then had the sales and marketing focus and positioning and that aspect of during the worldwide partner conference or inspire. And what I loved about ignite the way that it was, was it was more about here is there's some marketing but it was heavily skewed towards practical examples. Here's examples in the real world. It was a mesh of the product team and with vendors and experts saying, here's how we've actually gone and done it. Now, what's happened is they've all gotten squished together now with, uh, with the show that's coming uh, this next month. Um, they've combined the sales and marketing event Inspire in with uh, you know, with Ignite, okay. and it's one of the complaints, and my complaints is that Microsoft has moved the the these marquee events to almost entirely marketing efforts rather than uh, showcasing real world examples, practical examples, and having equal you know, like balance between community, uh, you know, MVPs and experts and partners versus all product teams right. pushing out marketing. Um, so. The so the my point in in talking about that cadence of the old way of doing things it feels like we're we're shifting back slowly back into that that old model um, because most of what I talk about I know you talk about we go and do is we're customer facing like it's great to sift through the marketing stuff but here's what the actual application of these things look like here's what um, and I often describe it as moving from the, uh, you know, just the purely qualitative, like, wouldn't it be great if, it, you know, in the future we could do it this way and this is exciting, get us hyped up. Um, but here are examples of what we're actually doing. Here's what yep. we see customers using. Here are the tangible, you know, uh, uh, quantifiable benefits that they're getting out of these solutions. Right, right. Uh, I, I have not been in the, the scene as long as you, uh, but in my short time here, from the very first Power Platform Community Conference, it was overwhelmingly community driven. Yep. And now that is the exception. Sure, there's community events, but this is mostly uh, Microsoft driven. Not, you know, I'm not complaining. Uh, I, the the promise uh, that the the marketing driven demo show or the talk tracks leads to a lot of excitement for people like you and I and 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 some of the listeners, uh, but it's the how. It, it's not just the what that is exciting. It's it's the how. Uh, well, it, and that. and that's why I say for things like this and like it, for example, I mean in Las Vegas, it wasn't even about what they were announcing because it you was know, as MV, MVPs we got early access, we knew the majority of what they were going to announce and details behind that. Uh, I am usually more interested in hearing like what questions did you have? So people coming out of those sessions, out of the keynotes, yeah, like what did you see? Like what what's sticking or what are you? you know, tripping up on, like what wasn't answered by those, those are generally better indicators of where there are then opportunities for yeah. partners, yeah. things for us to go and talk about and explain. Um, so that, that part of it has always been fun um, to, uh, 
I get so much more out of listening to the community. So fellow MVPs and mm -hmm. customers, the yeah. questions they ask yeah. than they ever do out of the sessions themselves. Yeah. That's usually one of the first questions, like what resonated with you? What stood out? Which is kind of like what we're talking about today. Like you asked the question, like we're, the two things that jumped out to me are the concept of agents, co-pilot agents, uh, and then the, uh, the, the plan designer and power apps. So that canvas application to build these solutions. Yeah. It's, uh, before we jump on that, uh, you know, we, we just said like have Microsoft does this at the conferences and doesn't do that at the conference. One of the things that was just incredibly valuable for me is I, I attended the, the power platform governance workshop held by Microsoft and they had, uh, Microsoft IT showcasing how they did it. So it wasn't a perfect blend of the, the, the prescriptive governance tools that you can use from Microsoft, from the, the product strategy team there. Yeah. But the real world examples of how Microsoft IT is, is governing power platform at scale using some of the tools. And, um, it, <clears throat> it was exciting and informing as governance conversations can be, but to understand how they do it. And, uh, you know, it was a very uh, pragmatic approach to governance that was uh, logical uh, mostly. And, uh, and, and, in, and in a few certain cases, surprisingly, uh, you know, black and white views of how things should go. But uh, uh, for me, total highlight. I'm like so glad yeah. that went and it was worth the whole trip just to hear how Microsoft IT does it because they're, they're ground zero, right, for a lot of this stuff. I, I always loved, uh, and, and this is, I completely agree, and I, I highly recommend, if you ever see um, a, a, a presentation where it's, uh, you know, Microsoft IT is on the road, and they're doing like a, like how we did it yeah. um, session on that. Um, for folks that don't aren't familiar with those types of sessions, and so like we both have, we've got friends at Microsoft that have gone and done these, some of them worldwide. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, a former coworker of mine that does a lot of these for Microsoft, um, Jim Adams, um, yeah. that, uh, that do a lot of these. Um, but, um, no, it, what's, what's great about that is, uh, it, they are the practitioners. They're the operations folks, the engineers that are actually doing them. It's not some marketing person that is going and is good at presenting on that topic. They send the actual you know, uh, uh, I'd say ground level leadership that is running those efforts, doing that operations work to get these things up and running. So um, uh, the only thing I would say is the only caveat that you need to balance there is to realize uh, that just like we would do as, as customers uh, and we see Microsoft says, hey, we released this new tool to help you manage this thing. The reality is they built that tool in flight while doing it, realizing we've got a gap, we're going to go build this solution. Um, but they do a lot of other things, just like we would do. We have a tool that does 80%. A lot of the details in, well, what did you do with the 20% that the tool couldn't go and do? And so sometimes you have to dig a little into those, even those presentations and how we did it and ask questions like, how did you do this? How did you pull this up? And they said, well, like we went and built some power apps that did these things, or we, yeah. we use PowerShell for this, or we built this new dashboard by, you know, from the ground up uh, in Power BI to give us this information and we fed this in over to this, to, to trigger this power app to do this thing. Um, so you, when you get into that detail, um, and again, those are the people that did the exact same thing. You just, it's never as polished as it looks even in those sessions, yes, as the presentation, ask the hard questions, folks. If you see a gap, if something's not being explained, it could be that they're glossing over because we all do it to move on. But we're usually happy to talk about those things if people ask those questions. Yeah. Well said. Ask the hard questions and remember, perfect doesn't exist. Yeah. And so sometimes only doing 80%. Is, is enough. <laughs> well, jumping over into the, the announcements here. Um, so we had, of course, uh, at, you know, 
prior to this, we had the the, the conference. There was a, the the wave two announcements. There's a lot. Mm. Spataro did this this whole uh, spiel. Um, Jared's fantastic. He went through, uh, knows his stuff as a marketing guy, but is deeply technical. Went through and talked about copilot pages and and announced the copilot agents and so that you know walk through each one of these things and of course you can go and find the article we'll have the link of course in the blog post um but you know go take a look at you know the the videos and there were of course then incremental updates to um you know various products here in excel powerpoint mm -hmm. outlook uh, word there was the huge announcement that just came out last week it just just happened with with OneDrive. um so that was actually um yeah, I don't know if you caught that live. I didn't, but I will tell you that I use uh, Copilot and OneDrive often to summarize files and interact with files and generate my own good notes on those files. So yeah, it's a, it's one of the very practical Copilots that I do like. So I'm gonna have to uh, uh, the, see if I can find it very quickly here. The uh, announcement uh, around there, it was uh, right here. Well, that's. Where's the announcement one? This is the supporting article. And I'll add this over in, in here. Yes, don't judge me for my search agent. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it, it, I'll, I'll actually, I'll go find the uh, Spataro um, article as well. I'll put it in order here um, <clears throat> and, and share that out there. But yeah, so there's a, uh, you know, big announcement around that. If you've not yet gone in and seen, um, I know they've been talking about uh, the, the the capabilities of like being able to go in and use Copilot to. I, I was thinking um, about the ability to go in and better organize the tens of thousands of digital images that I have on in multiple locations, for example, to be able to 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 make that process easier. Um, so there's yeah some cool things that are happening th there. Um, but the agents. Mm -hmm. So, Norm, what are copilot agents? Well, I, I, I think we may have seen some uh, early uh, versions of copilot agents in Power Virtual Agents, where you would develop your own, you know, biz talk type chatbot that could uh, reason over some of your content. But this is this is more focused towards. Uh, as I understand it, more focused towards certain content areas. So, for example, if we had a, um, a shared document or a, a shared uh, documents document library in a site full of authoritative uh, files uh, around a certain subject matter, we could put that uh, uh, copilot agent or the, the copilot studio agent on top of that uh, document repository and have it become a uh, interactive tool uh, for doing the the, the q a combined with the uh, uh the llm uh nature of of the ai copilots to start generating content that's just grounded in those files that you designate as part of the copilot agent now that's the first start uh, the first part and then once you get past that i believe we have the option now to bring actions into um, the the responses so let's say for example you're you're asking inventory questions about the inventory content and now you could say well is item x uh, trending or not trending towards good sales quotas in that information if it's not then have some type of trigger let's say it's the event on that inventory and then an action so like an if then uh, type of approach and then on that then when you take action Maybe that's a power automate workflow that will kick off an email or send a teams message or take some other type of action throughout. So we, as I understand it, we're, we're grounding our subject matter on a certain location. We have the ability to mature the copilot to do things like taking action. And so uh, now we have something and it's not just giving us regurgitated information, but can take actions. So, uh, Pretty powerful in concept. I'm probably not doing it justice with that explanation. It's not something I've got a lot of hands on time with yet, but it did seem exciting. Yeah, and this was, uh, I, I think 
part of what you know Microsoft has been talking about for a while and and it, what kind of registered in my mind was this idea of um you, you know similar to like the the PVA model is that um you know to to go build these independent um bots that will be triggered by certain actions and then go you know go run that in the background I don't have to go and kick it off like a script or, or, or entering a prompt for that. So something that I build, you know, uh, you know, as a, as a canvas app, but might also go in and build uh, a lot of that or all of it using just natural language to be able to go and use copilot to generate that and output might be a, you know, an, an agent, but is this idea that in the future, as this continues to grow and expand to um, you know, agents that are intelligent enough to call upon other agents. They, they know their own limitations. They understand that. And when a request comes in, that it goes and looks for the right other agents to trigger to complete that action, um, that, that whole concept. I've often talked about, and you've heard me like, refer to it, going back in my, you know, 20 years ago, my supply chain uh, experience for the idea of creating a service bus. And what we did 23, 24 years ago um, was all XML driven. It was, it was the, the, the kind of the common denominator between it. So you could have disparate tools that would um, go to this middleware component and have a conversation in XML. It could both uh, you know, read as well as, you know, output of XML. And so that you could get these proprietary tools that were never integrated, but working together, sharing the relevant information that they need, pass that along to go and take greater actions, more complex set of tasks. Right. Um, so it, it would be like, uh, I know that that is very high level and might be confusing to people, but as an example, uh, in my supply chain experience, it was, um, like I want to, um, I, I'm a, a manufacturer that's building a, uh, a new, uh, you know, mobile device, for example. Um, and I want to make a design change to that. Well, if I make a design change to it, I'm impacting like, uh, two dozen different vendors that have components that go in the existing design. If I try to make it thinner, um, then what are the impacts to that? So to be able to go and communicate the design change to the various systems, these vendors, it would, you know, that we're not meant to share, they can't read schematics of my design changes, but it would translate certain data in. It would say, well, if you made the design change, uh, for example, it would decrease by 25% the profile of these components. Well, that would send that information to those other systems that would see, okay, design change, is it feasible, this 25% size reduction of this, this part? It would share that information back and forth to these systems that weren't meant to talk to each other. Right. And, and so that you could have in a, a you know, near real time, I mean, it took time for that depending on the systems involved, but then to, to, to go take those other actions to, to act on those things. Yeah, that, right. that concept of though, of making a request in one place and then actions happening in multiple locations, um, that's what I think of when I think of the future of what agents can go and do. Right. And I, I don't think the, the plumbing is necessarily new to us. Like, the power of virtual agents, the chatbots, the, the ability to take action through workflow, to have a, a front end experience that people can interact with using natural language or, or business language. Like all of that has existed for some time, but there's been a, a very high barrier, even by power, power platform standards for business users to come in and start connecting all that plumbing. But to have the ability to come in and simply say in Copilot Studio, I, I want a chatbot that's going to manage my, help me manage my inventory and take action based on spoken word. And I guess this is where 
AI is really introduced in injecting the value into that plumbing to make it more approachable. Uh, we say power platform is low code to no code, but that's that's not really the case for some of these more advanced uh, apps and services that exist in there, especially with power virtual agents and and some power automate workflows. So I suppose that that is the promise is is bringing those barriers down and exposing that tool set to a broader audience of business users. So in that way, that's exciting. Yeah. Well, that's that's too. Uh, I mean, the the idea, and I'll I'll pull it back open here of of uh, you know the 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 canvas app approach and going and building these things. I mean, another another thing that just made me think of too is that you know that when you're when you're developing a solution to be able to visually represent you know the logic of the solution that you're trying yeah. to build. So again, it, it, to be able to leverage Copilot to say, hey, look, I want to. I want to do this thing. This is my, uh, this is the outcome that I'm looking for. Here's the data, here, the sources. And you're actually just like literally using language. You could even, you know, use the audio capability and, 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 and yeah. dictate in what you're looking for, but to go in and describe like, this is what it is. I need to pull this data from this source, this data from this other source. I need then to do this transformation. I need this output in this format. Um, at this place, this interaction, whatever, that to describe that and to get to the point where it can then go and build a visualization um, within that in a Canvas app where then you could go in and, you know, that could get you started at least and then refine the logic of that and the workflow and the other capabilities, um, design the rest of it. But you have that visual representation of that solution Right. that you can have a conversation with. Uh, and I've made this point a couple of times. I just said, it kind of reminds me of, you know, 25 plus years ago, working with rational software and the unified modeling language and the, you know, rational, what they were doing with rational rows, which was this idea of being able to go in using, it wasn't using natural language. It was using UML mm -hmm. to describe, to define a problem to define the use cases, the scenarios, the various yeah. actors and components within the model, you build the visual model. We could sit here, you know, you technical, me non-technical and outline map out the flow. And then this happens. And these are different components. And this is from this, this data source from that, the idea of rational rows was that it would then go and generate the starter code. Again, it was, Maybe it would work or not, but usually like get it started and then you go and finish it. Um, but you'd be able to have that view of, okay, I understand this is what we intend. This is the way that it's supposed to, to go and look. Kind of like give, talking too much about the visual modeling, you know, aspect of it, but um, that is just to, to, uh, to again, be able to describe that through yeah. text or, or words um, in natural language and for it to go and build these components that then the technical team could go and be like, okay, I have a better understanding. It's like the the gap that usually exists between what a business analyst does and the, and then working with the engineering team. Yeah. It, it's, it's, inter it's interesting you say that because I found this announcement to be one of the, the single most uh, exciting of them all. Uh, because it was such a paradigm shift from for how I approach uh, solution building with things like the Power Platform. Uh, usually, I have an idea of what a, a solution will look like, and I'm just trying to find the pieces to that final solution. Tell me about the tool. I need this component. I need this app. I need this work, but whatever the case might be. Instead of just coming to it from a diff like a completely opposite approach from a builder's or a maker's perspective, just tell me the problem. What are you trying to solve for? And that that's where you start. I mean, it, seem, it seems so logical when you say it out loud, right? Why would you build something when you don't know what you're building for? Uh, so what this means is you, you can work in, in parallel with a, a maker, a builder, or a pro dev, whatever the case is, and, and start this journey together instead of just sending off your your, you know, your, your business systems analyst out into the field to understand the program, then coming up with a spec, and then the spec goes over the over the fence to the, the developer to build out. This is like, tell me the problem. Okay, 
your version, your understanding of the problem today might be different tomorrow. So tomorrow, refine the problem. Now that you know what the problem is, why don't you tell me more about it? Why don't you give me some artifacts that help explain it? Like maybe a sample of the data that you're currently using or you think you might be using. Yeah. Do you have any process flow diagrams um, that might complement or explain the process? Uh, do you have inputs and outputs that you're aware of? Who are some of the people that, you know, job roles that you might be working with? And you have the ability in this tool, in this canvas to start uploading those artifacts to give the, uh, the co-pilot in the uh, form builder to, sorry, is it the form builder? The plan builder, excuse me. Plan builder, yep. The plan builder to start reasoning over it. And then you get, you have the ability to reiterate or iterate through uh, your understanding of the problem. And you start to decompose the problem into a data model. And the, you know, the, the tables are either there from Dataverse already and you can leverage them or it's going to build them out to, to serve the needs uh, of that solution. And again, you can iterate to refine and uh, you don't have to live with that first version. And I, and I suppose that's one of the great things about ChatGPT or Copilot is like sitting in a chat and refine, refine, refine to get it to where you need it to be. We can do the same thing here. And then when you start to have a, a, the architecture for a solution tied all the way back to a business problem that you're solving for and all of the components in between the two, the data model, uh, the forms, uh, connective workflows, buttons that take actions, uh, different app interfaces, whether it's like a mobile app, a model-driven app, a Canvas app, depending on the use case, they didn't come all the way down and say, press a button and start building. Yeah. Holy moly, talk about well, fast tracking time to value. And well, it, it doesn't have to be like this waterfall approach, right? It can be agile and iterative all the way through to get you to like a minimum viable product. So super exciting for me. Can't wait to see it in action. Well, this, this is, uh, well, what is, uh, so just rings true, uh, around, you know, all of this is that, uh, so like, I know I've talked about it a couple of times and we've, uh, uh, done recordings together, but my, uh, software company that I co-founded that back in 97 and sold to rational software in 2001 um a company called uh, cosis which was a terrible name but the is which was an acronym for quality object oriented software engineering systems but what our solution um that we built was called blocks um it was around um pattern recognition so of course we didn't have the benefits of where technology is right. and of the uh, of the graph, you know, concept. I mean, what we built was essentially we were building a social graph. We didn't know to call it a social graph, um, but we had these massive models, but it was about pattern recognition. So similar to this, the way that this works is that you start, you would start entering in your requirements and the, the platform blocks would start to look for patterns in your request and start serving up like, Hey, you are an you know a a seventy five percent match to of what you're asking for to this delivered project. Here are the components. Yeah. Similar with this, you start building the solution, entering in you know information. This is what we're trying to do. Here's the data sources. Here's the the people. Here's the key scenarios. It starts then making suggestions for existing solutions that you might be able to leverage of workflows of other of other you know, agents that are out there, other power apps to start leveraging so it can speed up. The idea for us was we would talk about, you know, pattern recognition, reuse of components from documentation to actual, you know, executed code that could be leveraged as part of this based on your initial input and refinement of that. Essentially, that's what we're doing here. Yeah. Just so much, you know, a hundred x more powerful than what we right. built twenty five years ago. But um, yeah, we often said that we were we recognized that we were way ahead of where things were, um, and it's why we had as we were pitching it to VCs, we often got multiple meetings with some VCs, one three times, where they said, "Guys, we're like the the problem is that." 
it would have taken, you know, years and millions of dollars to get to the point where it would really be viable for what we envisioned there. Um, and, uh, and so we, you know, had, had a buyer, had an option, took some cash. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it, this, but so this, this whole concept of being able to go in and the more that you're doing and building, I mean, think of this even from a governance standpoint, mm -hmm. and then the data that you'll be able to start seeing is that more and more requests that are leveraging these other existing assets or new assets that are being built, but being able to go and leverage the knowledge, the expertise, the, the time that's been spent inside your organization, leverage that and reuse those components yep. is that's huge. Massively huge. And I do like that there is a, almost a prescriptive element to this, uh, power apps, uh, plan designer knows about and has been trained on no one good data models, no one good uh, workflows, form design, form layouts. It knows how to observe best practices. So 80% of what it is going to deliver might meet your needs with that other 20% being flexible to adapt to your unique use cases. And I, I just think that is, uh, where we start to find value in, in all this AI is in the prescriptive side where I can implement known good things that I don't have to spend all of my time figuring out the right tooling to use, the right yeah. approach to the solution. Like I just fast track me to value. That's yeah. what I really want here. Yeah, it just made me think too. Just thought of another it'd be an interesting perspective on this. So, um, with my other uh, my series uh, project failure files, a project management related, and we were talking about, you know, the 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 rare issue of uh, I'm sure you've heard of it called scope creep. Oh, yeah, sure, <laughs> uh, that happens to every project, um, every uh, uh, consulting client engagement. No, but to be able to even to some degree track scope creep in the request. So you're out building that and you could start to do things. Like I was using the example of my supply chain background of, of uh, like demand planning saying, well, in design changes and, and understanding the downstream impact to a design change to all the things around there. Um, similarly, like scope creep that happens is we've defined it and we have this, we're moving even forward and then, oh, I forgot something that we also need to do, which could fundamentally change that output. But we even have the ability to, like, this would be a really cool add-on to uh, uh, to plan designer is to even do like a, a like have an audit trail of the scope enhancements yeah, yeah. to awesome. an existing solution. Yep, I imagine there's a. There's a, there's an industry, there's a regulation that you would have to track. Yep. You just application for that type of thing. So. Maybe it's something that happens over an offered as a feature within DevOps, you know, that, mm -hmm. that solution or, or something, but yeah, but I, I mean, you're right. I mean, this is a really cool thing. I'm excited to see more, um, around that. And it fits into really the focus of our conversations. I mean, both the insights part of it learning more about i mean here's an example on screen as it's going through and being able to help search and filter the data for different users and yep. getting more insights out of your data and the applications as well as the automation of those activities okay. of course uh so it is i i think this is all um i don't i, I can't remember if this is currently in um is it in preview right now i get preview yeah Okay. I know that there were a bunch of the announcements and there's some things where the preview was not even yet open and available. Yep. The things that were coming the, this fall. So that's a, I know that's a frustrating thing too, is when Microsoft gets us all hyped up around a new technology and then it's not even available in a preview program yet. Yeah. That's right. 
but that's part of what they do is, and is and that's, uh, again from the outset we said right at the beginning part of the for me anyway it's like part of the reason why i want to go to this is feel excited about some of the technology when it's when technology is your work i mean it's it's work <laughs> like it's hard to get excited about things uh, but something like this that that's that's a total standout for me because it it does it's it's a it's like looking into the future through a, a magic crystal ball to to see what uh, how transformative that these technologies are going to be and how we're going to work and interact with things and yeah uh, you know for for me like the excitement has always been with with ChatGPT Copilot and and the other AI models is getting more of my day back to spend on higher value work and right. whether that is a large game like we might see with plan designer or meeting recaps which just save my life every day or it's just something smaller and I, I know there's other announcements that that we've seen out there where even it's like something as small as an intelligent copy and paste that i think we saw in one of those power yep. platform advertisements. Yep. that was also one of the announcements yep yeah just like I've got my email open on one side or a document on one side and my power app on the other. And it's smart enough to know that I'm probably doing a copy and paste and can do it for me based on some form recognition. I mean, that, assuming it's right, <laughs> there's like five minutes of my day back. Yeah. And, you know, I think you were on, on your latest uh, 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 tweet jam, you were talking about uh, uh, you know, quantifying the uh, the value of Copilot and all these other things, and uh, I've given a lot of thought about that. I know the company I work at; they, we do a lot of time talking about this, and I've talked to users on the floor at the Power Platform Conference. Like, what's value to you? And I've had people, you know, talking huge numbers of of time back uh, to move up higher on that value chain for them. Yep. One company in particular. So five minutes. So if they can get five minutes back a day, then the license pays for itself over time and time again. Microsoft but, saying like three hours on average a week saved. Yeah, uh, we're seeing that internally at uh, App Point as well. That's the the gold standard, I think, yeah. for time saved. And I know that that time saved comes with a, a path to maturity to to understand how to use Copilot effectively, just like any other tool. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I know in some areas of my work, I get that back. I get that five minutes back, you know, fivefold every day that I'm using meeting recap and don't have to take notes. Yep. Right. But, uh, and I want this in Power Platform as well. I want this in Microsoft 365. They're not platforms. It's just my work. I want higher up on the value chain. So these little announcements, some of them are small, some of them are huge. The idea for me is let's keep moving up that value chain so I can keep working on what's important that really takes thinking like the good, the value add thinking, not the taking meeting minutes. Did you do your action? Like that's, that's right. not valuable work for me. It's, it's, it's funny that there, cause I, I, I talk about all the time and I have for, for many, many years talked about um, it, it's easy to talk about, especially when you're talking in, in collaboration and automation, mm -hmm. you know, less so, but still if you have to articulate, what is the actual the ROI of this effort? One of the best ways that you can look at something where there's a qualitative improvement uh, is to look at you know efficiency, time savings. Exactly your point. If I were able to set save five minutes a day, um, well, I can you know that time is you know five minutes of my day, you know uh, uh, five days a week for a month. Uh, and then against my hourly, well, I charge a lot or, around that. It then it's much more than paying the thirty dollars a month for, you know, the copilot license. I mean, you have to look at it that way. If I'm able, if you're able to save five minutes a day per person across your company over the course of a year, and just multiply that by the average, uh, uh, you know, the average income of your employees. Um, right there, you'll have a number and show that that number will be greater, even yep. at five minute savings a day, than the cost of 
the additional licenses. Isn't that shocking? And but you're going to save much more like five value. minutes. At scale, it's massive. It's harder to go in there and, and put a, a, a you know quantitative measurement around a, like, what what is a lost opportunity today? What is innovation that's not happening today? Right. Because I'm not able to focus as much time on these higher functions activities, higher quality activities. Like you're just talking about time savings, efficiency today, what we can see, there's much more value on top of that. And yeah, so, sure. and making that case, we used to do that with migrations where we would say as a migration vendor, we would say, Hey, like, well, how much time do you spend a day on these administrative tasks? Or if you're going to go do a migration, mm -hmm. how much time in a week are you spending? If we're able to save you 10% of that time and we show how we do that, but 10% of that time, all right, how many people do you have working on this? Okay. We've got six people you expected to take, you know, nine to 12 months for this, all of the migration activities for the life of the project. All right. Add all that up. It's usually triple quadruple or more greater than the cost of the software to reduce those things. Yeah, indeed. And so, uh, yeah. a lot of that quantification is happening at the user level. Like how much time did Christian say versus norm? Uh, and eventually we mature up and we start assessing this at a, a team level, department level, organization level, and then company wide, and then massive improvements, but it's not always going to be the same copilot right. that give those, like, those large savings at the business level. It's, it's still going to be individual personal productivity for a while. Yeah. We just have to think about that when Microsoft said, when, you know, shares these use cases, these companies that are sharing these what seem like massive numbers when you break it down to a number of employees the ones that have those licenses over in you know down in their day-to-day -day work i mean you're, you're talking about minute um changes to again just the efficiency number of that yep. not even talking about the other the added value on top of that um, but that very quickly you can explain and justify that additional licensing cost yeah, okay. indeed. I guess that's the, uh, you know, companies that start to to transform themselves into AI first type of companies, they might look at something like plan designer and the power platform as an opportunity to make uh, larger surges ahead in that value. When they look at some of those those non ERP type systems that keep the company running, the ones that there's no third party vendor for that they have to build in house and they don't have the, the people resources or they don't have the, the the time with the resources they have to build something like that. They can fast track this value. And now we're, we're going beyond personal productivity and now they can start taking larger platform adoption to yield greater uh, savings. And, and I think that's where plan designer, especially I think is where a lot of this promises will start to bring Again, the promise of the power platform more to the fore, where the, it's going to start really paying for itself. And people won't be looking at the cost of licensing as the only deciding factor whether they adopt the power platform. And it'll be more of a an enablement play across the whole organization with something like Copilot or with Power Platform to start to realize these, those gains. So I, I suppose it is a very exciting time. We're at this convergence point where AI is fast tracking a lot of the promise and this technology that we've had in Microsoft 365 and in the Power Platform. Yep. Well, Norm, exciting stuff. Of course, I'll have uh, links to uh, uh, everything that we've shared here on screen um, for those watching the video, um, but we'll have uh, links to all that in the blog post, which you can also find over on the uh, podcast so in the description. Um, so you can link over and get access to anything that we've talked about. But Norm, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for being a, a guest again. And we'll see you in the next month and a half, like in between travels. And we'll do our updates with the, what I'm sure there will be more announcements coming out of the next slew of events. We've got, you know, between now and the next time we meet, you know, the major events, like I'll be down in Dallas for TechCon. Um, there's Ignite happening in Chicago. Right. And then I'll be the beginning of December, I'll be in uh, uh, in Stockholm for ESPC. So 
some places where there are usually an announcement or two coming out of that. I'm also interviewing Jeff Teeper again, one of the keynotes for ESPC. So I'll, I'll probably have some, you know, updates that are coming out of from those, those events for sure. You can get the insider track from, uh, from Mr. Teeper and you know, maybe I'll be in Dallas as well for TechCon. Oh, why Hey, okay. Why don't we do this there? Well, there's another conversation about uh, doing a live recording and bringing the gear and getting quality audio and video out of it versus right here in the security of our home with all of this, this setup. But yeah, we'll definitely do something. So, yeah, uh, that well, sounds good. Person. so great Thanks to see you. Time. Thanks everybody for watching and listening. Take care of it. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.